Welcome everybody to the Cody Miller Show. Happy Monday morning. This is the ultimate swimming related show where we talk about all things floating through the world of swimming. That's current events, breaking stories, racing, results, training, tips, tricks, whatever you, the audience, wants to talk about, that is what we're here for. And thank you all for joining me on this Monday morning. Before we get started, a couple things off the top, really just one. The duel in the pool took place this past weekend, and I am pre-recording this episode, so the meet has not finished yet. So we will cover duel in the pool in the following Cody Miller show. So for today, we're not gonna get into that, but it is very, very exciting. Um, I am a super nerd who is waking up here at like 4 a.m. in the United States to get stuff going so that I can watch the live stream because it's, I mean, it's live stream super, super early. So if you're a hardcore nerd like me, like maybe you're getting into that, I don't know. Anyway, let's dive into the main topics of today's show. And how do I select the main topics of the show? It's really easy. You create the topics and you submit them right here to Cody Miller Show at gmail.com. Whenever you come across a topic or a piece of news or something that you would like to hear my thoughts on, fire me an email to Cody Miller Show at gmail.com and you might see your topic or question show up here as a main topic. And without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into this. And our first topic of the day comes to us from JT from Romania. And JT writes, hey Cody, it finally happened. The world record in the men's 100 meter freestyle was broken. Our man David Popovich swam a 46.86 to win the European Championships. Now that he's the GOAT, do you think that David will continue to get faster? Can he break the world record in the 200 meter freestyle as well? Can't wait to hear your thoughts. Love the new video podcast and thank you for the best part of the day. All right, thank you so much, JT. And yes, it was so funny. Last week when I recorded the first episode of The Cody Miller Show, basically right after that, that that's when David shattered this world record. And I was like, ah, well, I guess we'll talk, it, talk about it on ne next week's show because I've gotten so many submissions from you all that you wanna hear my thoughts on this. So let's dive into this. So you brought up a couple of points. Let's break this down. Number one, 4686, that swim was amazing. I am a hardcore swim fan and looking at his underwaters, like his underwater catch, seeing it, it was a beautiful swim, a beautiful swim. So the first question, can he get faster? Can David re-break this world record? How much can he lower this world record by? Let's talk about that. I mean, the dude is 17 years old. He's pretty skinny, so ideally, he would have a lot of room for improvement. And I've been thinking a lot about this. It would be interesting, it's going to be interesting to see how he develops over the next few years. It's going to be interesting to see if he does grow anymore, if he puts on more muscle, because some sprinters, although sprinters tend to be a little more, a little more buff, right? Like they have a little more muscle mass on them. Some of the fastest sprinters in the world do better when they're on the leaner side. Like even a guy, even a guy like Anthony Irvin, you know, he was pretty lean. He was a pretty lean swimmer, you know, when he won the gold medal in 2000 and then again in Rio. Um, and so can David get faster? I believe he will. I certainly believe he's going to re-break this world record. And the question then becomes by how much, right? Because he recently said in an, in an interview that he was inspired by Adam Peaty's Project 56, right? For those of you who really follow the swimming world, you know, Adam Peaty, being the world record holder and the greatest 100 meter breaststroker ever, was very vocal on social media and was very vocal in interviews that his goal was to break 57 seconds, was to go 56 in the 100 meter breaststroke. Project 56, that was his thing. And uh, David has said he's been inspired by this and he says he wants to go 45. So now the question becomes, can David go 45 seconds in the long course 100 meter free? I don't know. Um, I really don't know. I, I hope someone does, some, like, because here's the thing. The thing with this record, with this event, the men's 100 meter freestyle long course, 
We have known for a long time now that it's just a matter of time before this world, before this world record gets broken. The former world record, 46.9, was held by Cesar Cielo set in 2009. And we've had a number of athletes come close, right? Caleb Dressel, I think most recently went 40, 46.9 at the 2019 World Championships where he won gold and almost broke it. He was just a few hundredths of a second off. And there have been a couple other guys that have been close. And we've had a number of people in the 47 low range. So it's just been a matter of time of, okay, who's going to be the one to do it? And for a while, I thought Caleb was going to do it. And for a while, a lot of people thought Dressel was going to be the guy to do it. He got close. He didn't quite snag it. But now David snagged it. Now David cracked it. And now can he keep getting faster? Well, let's take a look at what Adam Peaty did when he shattered the world record. I mean, in modern day swimming, we have not seen a world record in the 100 meter in the in any 100 meter distance broke by this substantial of a margin. So 10 years ago, I'm taking you back to 2012, the world record in the men's 100 meter breaststroke was a 58.58. I'm sorry, no, that was in 2009. It was a 58.46 held by Cameron Vandenberg of South Africa. 58.46. And then Adam Peaty breaks this world record and goes 57.9 in 2015. And I remember where I was when, when Peaty first went 57.9. I heard the news in the locker room leaving a practice. Like, yeah, some British guy just, just broke the world record in the 100 breaststroke. And he didn't just break it. He broke it by five tenths. He broke it by half a second. He went 57. And everyone, it was, it, was, it was insane. It was so hard to comprehend that someone didn't just break the world record in a 100 meter distance, but they broke it by half a second. And then the speculation was, okay, now we're leading into the Rio Olympics. How much faster can Adam Petey get? How much faster can he get? Can he match that world record? Will we ever see him match that world record? People forget because now we've seen we've seen him go 56. But at the time, we were all speculating, right? Is this possible? And then at the Rio Olympics, I was literally swimming right next to him, but Adam Petey goes 57-5 in the semifinals. And then in the final, he goes 57-13. 57 So he's now broke the world record by well over a second. And it was mind blowing. And that's then when Adam Petey launched, you know, a year later, Project 56, can he go 56? And he did. Adam Petey went 56 in the 100 meter breaststroke. He went 56, 88, an amazing swim at the 2019 World Championships. Hard to comprehend. And so now, bringing it back to David, David has just now, re just now broken that long standing world record. Can David go 45 in the 100 meter freestyle. Well, history has showed us via Adam P that things like this are possible, that obliterating a world record by a large margin, even in a shorter race like a 100 meter freestyle is possible. I would love to see it. Like I hope that he does. I'm rooting for him. Like as a swim fan, the idea of someone going 45 seconds in a 100 meter free like excites me. It's it, it kind of breaks my brain because it's hard to, hard to comprehend. But you know, and, and here's another question that that um, that I that I'd like to bring up, and that is this: Can he break the world record in the 200? Can he break the world record in the 200 meter freestyle? Because he just set the world junior. It's crazy that it, that he won European Championships and he's still considered a junior. So he's the world junior world record holder at a 142.9 in the 200 meter freestyle. Makes him the third fastest 200 freestyler ever. I believe it is the textile world, world record. So the current world record in the men's tuner freestyle is held by a man named Paul Biederman of Germany, 142.00, set in 2009 in the full body super suit. The second fastest time ever, Michael Phelps, the guy right behind him, also in a full body super suit. And now, now that David has gone 142.9, he did it in a textile suit. You know, so he kind of is the world record holder, like depending on how you want to look at it, even though the majority of the super suit era records have been broken, he's the textile world record holder and he's considered a junior world record holder. So can he break the world record in the tuner me freestyle? I think he can. The question is by how much? Like I think that if this dude continues to progress, 
it's gonna be amazing. And, and one other question that is super interesting to me is, okay, once something happens, once a record gets broken, once the world recognizes what is possible, then the floodgates open, right? Then the floodgates open. You know, the, the, the first time someone went 49 in the 100 meter freestyle, just a few years later, then they had five, six, seven, eight guys going 49 in the 100 meter freestyle. And now that David has rebroke this record, if he keeps getting faster, I'm wondering if that's gonna push, push the whole, like the, the heat of men as a whole to be faster. Because right now we see a good number of guys at high level meets go 47 mids pretty regularly, right? 47.5 sometimes wins. I think 47.4 is what won world championships. If David smashes the 100 meter freestyle world record by, by a, a greater margin, which is what we wanna see, then what happens to the rest of the field? Does the rest of the field get faster? Because once Adam Peaty went 56, people started thinking, huh, well, 58 low isn't even that, isn't that crazy. What used to be the former world record is now, you know, it's small potatoes compared to 56. And so now, now we've seen a guy like Arno Kaminga come in and also go 57 seconds in the 100 meter breaststroke. And now we've seen a guy like um, Nicolo of, uh, of Italy going 58-2, and there's a number of guys going 58 low. So when, when someone comes in and completely obliterates a record and shows the world what is possible, then that field of men or women starts shifting closer to that world record. Does that, you know what I'm trying to say. So, so what I'm saying is like, how is it going to affect the rest of the world? Like the overall performances? That's, that's something that I'm curious about, but I guess we'll see. But anyway, thank you, JT, for the question. What do you all think? Do you think David is gonna re-break this world record? Is 45 seconds in the 100 meter freestyle possible? Can he, can he go 141 in the 200 meter freestyle and break Paul Biederman's world record? Is that possible? Let me know what you guys think down below. I personally think it's right now for David, it's gonna come down to how does he manage the pressure that is now on top of him? Like how is he gonna manage the fame, the pressure and the expectations? Because it is a lot easier for athletes on the climb up, but once you make it, once you summit Everest, living on top of those mountains and being there and being the greatest, that is harder. That is much harder. There's a much larger target on your back. So I'm super interested and curious to see how it all works out. So thank you so much. Let's move on to topic number two. And topic number two comes to us today from Astrid from Sweden. And Astrid writes, Greetings, Cody. We're all still processing David Popovich's amazing swims at the European Championships. So I'm curious, did you see that Popovich credited his performances to avoiding social media? I'm wondering, is this something all high-level athletes should do or, should, or shouldn't do? I'm wondering what your thoughts and experiences with this kind of thing are. I hope to make it on the show. Thank you for the weekly inspiration and all your hard work. Cheers. Okay, thank you Astrid for that submission. Yes, in, a, in an interview following David's amazing performances, he said, and I'm gonna read directly, he said, after the 100 meter world record, the attention was huge. I think what helped me to stay focused was that I avoided checking the social media. As positive as it can be, social media can be toxic as well. I know I would have had a hard time falling asleep, so I think that was a good decision. My plan is to keep on working hard and going forward step by step. That is what he said after breaking the world record. It would be hard to fall asleep. So, I remember, after I made, after I qualified for my first Olympic team, I had like 3,000 Instagram followers. And after I qualified for the Olympics, made Team USA, I then had 9,000 followers, like the next day. And I thought, huh, that's kind of wild. Um, I'm gonna kind of, kind of stay away from this because I wanted to shield myself from what other people were saying about me, good or bad. And then at the Olympics. In the Rio Olympic Village, I'm sitting in my room the day after I won my individual medal. And I open up my phone and I had avoided social media totally. Um, and after I'd won that medal, I then went from 9,000 followers to about 50,000 followers in the course of like 12 hours. 
And I thought, wow, this is crazy. And so David is certainly going through something like that. Like he is blowing up. And I have been in a lot of situations in my career where I've read things about myself online from people that I've never met before, from people that I don't even know. And it's really not healthy. It's certainly not a good thing. So I would absolutely recommend staying off of social media at any competitions, really just putting on the blinders. We call it putting on the blinders. Um, this is something that Caleb Dressel has talked an awful lot about. Um, you know, as he leads into big meets, like he, he doesn't do any of it. He stays off of it completely. doesn't want to see anything because, you know, there's no benefit to outside influence, to hearing things that people are saying about you, to reading things because it just... A lot of times people say things on social media that is that is negative because they're trying to get a reaction or because they're not really thinking how it's going to affect the person on the other side of that screen, right? I often describe it as, even though a lot of it is positive, it's not a true form of human interaction, right? Like we are meant to be social beings. We are meant to sit in front of one another and talk to each other. That's why we have facial expressions. You can you can tell how someone is perceiving what you're saying. You're kinder to someone when you're sitting in front of them because you directly receive how what your words, what your words are doing is affecting that person in front of you. And with social media, all of that is stripped away. And um, it kind of gives people the license to say a lot of negative things and it happens with, with sports and fandom and all that. And so the best thing to do is certainly shield yourself from those things. Now there are cases where some people like to read some of the negative stuff and they, they see it as a form of motivation. Um, I remember Michael Phelps telling stories about there were certain news, news outlets that were doubting whether or not he could do something, like doubting whether or not he could win eight Olympic gold medals or doubting whether he could beat one of one of his foes in an event that he hadn't quite reached his peak yet. And he used that as motivation. Um, that's a little different than social media because with social media, it's an overload of thousands and thousands of comments about certain individuals. And it's not healthy. Like we're not designed to perceive that amount of information, particularly about oneself. And I'm a person who's been through situations where I did something bad or I disqualified a relay or I said something I shouldn't have said that maybe I didn't even mean and it was taken out of context. And people write things about, have written things about me that I have then had to read and then deal with the ramifications. And it just really, really sucks because majority of the time, People don't know what you're physically experiencing. They don't know what you're going through. Like, they're not there, they're not in your shoes. And because of that, their opinions shouldn't matter because they don't know, people don't know. And so yes, I hope that what, what David just said, I hope he continues to, to do that because he said, you know, he felt like at the meet, he dipped his toe in the water and thought, mm, this probably isn't a good idea, I'm gonna stay off of it. But I, I would implore younger athletes to really, really have rigorous discipline about the amount of time they're spending on social media and avoiding things people say about you. Avoiding thing, avoiding speculation, right? One thing that a lot of the, the swimming trades will do, you'll see it on Swim Swam or Swimming World, um, they'll, as fans, discuss what they think will happen. They'll, as fans, talk about their predictions, about times, about who's gonna win. And that's a part of fandom. Like, we have to do that. I'm going to do that on this channel. Like, I'm gonna talk about those things. I, I love talking about those things. I love speculating about how people are gonna swim. I love speculating about what time someone's gonna go for all the various reasons, right? Like, that's, that's a part of sport. But as the athlete living in that world, absorbing that information, is not good and is not beneficial for you. And so if there are younger athletes watching this, really monitor the amount of time you're using social media and avoid the negative stuff. Avoid, put put those blinders on, especially leading into big meets. You know, for the latter half of my career, when I would go into a meet, I would stay completely off social media. And I know that a lot of the greats do that. And I hope David can be steadfast and really avoid a lot of the pitfalls that are gonna come his way now that he is starting to reach an insane level of, of fame and an insane level of notoriety in our swimming world and really just in the world of sport, period. So that's a great question. Thank you, Astrid, for that question. I hope that, that that answers your question. I hope that that helps. And now let's move on to topic number three. And topic number three comes to us from Frida from Nor Norway. And Frida writes, Hey Cody, I've been a long time vlog follower and I'm super excited about the new show. My question is about the results of the European Championships. Aside from the obvious, Popovich, 
What was the most impressive or exciting race you saw? Thank you for the amazing swimming content. You're the best. Okay, thank you, Frida, for that question. And yes, European championships have wrapped up and it was it was fun to watch. Like there were a lot. Honestly, I was surprised at how fast the majority of the field is given that we just had world championships not that long ago. And this one hits a little close to home. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the one swimmer that stood out the most to me, and there were a number of standouts for sure, and we could talk about that for an hour long, but the one person I'm gonna talk about is the Italian breaststroker, Nicolo Martinegi. I think that's how you pronounce his name, Martinegi, Martinegi. Um, this guy, this guy won gold in the 50 and the 100 meter breaststroke at the European Championships, and went the third well, he became the third fastest performer in history in the 50 breaststroke, which hits close home to me. I'm a breaststroker, I'm a little biased, but still, he swam at 26.33, tying Felipe Lima, I believe, for the third slash second fastest performer ever. The only other guy that's ever been faster than that is Adam Peaty. Like, it's an amazing time. Like, he's inching closer to going 25 seconds in a 50 meter breaststroke. He also swam, I believe it was an Italian record, the Hunter breaststroke, he went 58-2. And then on the relay on the last night, he split a 57-7 on the Hunter on, on the breaststroke leg of that relay. And this guy, you know, he's definitely being overshadowed by, okay, Adam Peaty being so much faster than everybody else, right? Adam Peaty's world record of 56, Adam Peaty going 57. But that to me, the second slash third fastest performance in history is amazing in and of itself. He also had a really impressive world championships, right? He won gold medals at world championships and then had to turn it around a few weeks later and head to European championships. And the way that he was able to carry that momentum and step up again and perform well again and go faster again, that is really difficult. You know, because in our sport, the hierarchy is the Olympic games is the pinnacle. Then you've got the world championships. And then you've got a, a number of other meets, right? And Europeans is in there somewhere. And for, for some European countries, the European championships is gonna mean more to others. Um, and I'm assuming Italy takes it very, very seriously because I tell you what, Team Italy crushed it. Like Thomas Tom, Thomas the backstroker, check on, I think is how you say his name. I mean, he also had an amazing meet. But yeah, if I'm gonna highlight anyone and tell you to go and look up some of the clips and some of the races, I'm gonna tell you to look up um, Nicolo's breaststroke because that 50 breaststroke is amazing. I think he's gonna keep getting faster. He's 23 years old, he's pretty young, he's a stud. And you know, I wanna highlight guys that are a little overshadowed by maybe Adam Peaty, even though I love Adam and I wanna, you know, I love watching him race. But yeah, that's, that's my pick. What do you all think? What was the standout performance of the European Championships in your mind? You know, there were some really fast times in the men's 400 freestyle, aside from David Popovich, Popovich, of course. Okay, let me know in the comment section below what do you think. But I'm telling you right now, that 50 breaststroke. Whew, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was quite a swim. All right, thank you, Frida, for the question. Now let's move on to topic number four. Topic number four comes to us today from Chris from Alabama, and Chris writes, "Yo, yo, Cody. I started as a casual rec swimmer, but after discovering your vlogs a year ago, I've gotten really into swimming." Ah, I love I love hearing that. I'm following it way more now. I know who the top tier USA swimmers are, like Ledecky and Dressel. But here's my question. Who is the number one American swimmer who's ripe for a mega breakout? Who could be a major team USA star in Paris 2024 that the more casual spectators haven't heard of yet? I hope to get my question answered. You rock. Okay, everybody. Thank you for the question, Chris. And I love this. I love this because yes, the normal, the normal swimming fans, we all know, like we're in this world, like we know who the top dogs are, but who is on the precipice of really breaking out and being one of those superstars in 2024? Now we can play the speculation game. And I, I will propose one name that has surprised me, that has shocked me, that is doing things in a range of events that I didn't expect in the long course format, 
someone who I think could be a stud, could win multiple medals and be a Team USA powerhouse athlete. And that is that is Shane. That that is, I mean, Shane Cassis, this dude, for those of you who don't know, Shane swam at Texas A&M and was a very good NCAA swimmer. His senior year, he went some amazing times. I was trying to pull those up, but at the 2021 World Championships in Greensboro, he won three individual events. He won a 139.5 in the 200 IM, which is insane. Um, he won a 44.2 in the 100 back, which is nuts. And he went a 135.75 in the 200 back. For my international viewers, Obviously, those are yards times, and those mean nothing to you. But I'm telling you, those are some of the fastest swims in history. And he did that in the short course format as a senior. And then at the world, at the Olympic trials, the United States Olympic trials, he got third place. He got third place in the hunter backstroke. You know, he got beat by Hunter Armstrong and Ryan Murphy, and didn't make the team, but still went a very impressive 52 seconds. And as a swim fan, watching what happens to the field after Olympic trials is always one of the most interesting things. People who make the team and then go to the Olympics, okay, what comes next, right? Whether they crushed it or they had a disappointing me, how do they handle that situation? And the same for people that got third or fourth place or had a disappointing trials. I love rooting for people, rooting for people to have a major comeback. And that is what Shane has had. He has been on a tear since missing that Olympic team. He's won multiple medals at the Short Course World Championships. This past year, he qualified for the Long Course World Championship team for, for Team USA. And then he won a bronze medal in the men's 200 meter backstroke. And I was actually doing the, uh, doing the, the Swim Swam live watch along show during his race, I remember. And I was talking to Mel you know, after his swim, because he swam that race really aggressively. He went out in the tuner back very fast. Like I think he was first at the 100 wall, maybe even first at the 150 wall, and then faded a little bit and ended up getting third. Won a medal, but wasn't quite, you know, what probably what he was hoping for, which was to win. And I'm say, I'm thinking, man, this guy, this guy's still really raw, has tons of room for improvement. He swam college at Texas A&M, but now he's living in Austin, training for probably the greatest coach of all time, Eddie Reese, and that whole Texas crew, which is very deep and very strong and produces dozens of Olympians just regularly. So this guy's gonna keep getting better. And look at this, look at this. After, after he wins that bronze medal at the World Championships, he then comes back to the United States and he swims at US Nationals. And some of his times, at U.S. Nationals were bananas, absolutely bananas. So he swims the 100 fly and goes 50.4, 50.4. I mean, that that's a, that's a time that could win gold at a world championships, you know, barring maybe Caleb or Kristoff going 49, 50.4 is nuts. He went a 155.2 in the 200 meter IM. That's something that I, I didn't see coming. I remember, I think it was the last day he was doing the turn and I am, and I was like, this is gonna be interesting. How fast are you gonna go? And he went like 157 in prelims. I was like, all right, that's pretty fast. And then 155.2. See, now he's in the conversation for the best male I am or in the 200 for the United States. And, you know, obviously he, he trains with a, a number of, of those other guys, like, you know, like Carson. And so, oh, and also he split a 48.28 um, on uh, in in the hunter freestyle in the, in in the prelims 48-2 in the hunter freestyle so he could be a relay guy too so Shane could be a guy who swims multiple individual events has potential to win medals just based on the times he's done now and he's gonna get I think he's gonna get faster like I think this is a dude that's gonna keep getting faster and with him going 48-2 flat start if he keeps getting faster he could be a guy that splits 47 mid and is on a relay that potentially wins gold at the Paris 2024 Olympics. So your question, your question, Chris, who do you think, who do I think is going to be the next great American standout star? Well, right now I think it's probably Shane, you know, and it's, it's gonna come down to what events does he choose? What does the event lineup look like at trials, at the Olympics? Like, how is he going to structure that? But he's in the right place, training it, you know, training at Texas, training under Eddie Reese with that group of guys. I mean, he's a standout star. It's been amazingly fun to watch him swim this fast. Um, and he's he shocked everybody. So I think he's, I think he could be, he could be the guy. He could be one of the, one of the top dogs. So 
Thank you, Chris, for the question. Um, what do you all think? You know, now you've heard what I've had to say. Who do you think is going to be a huge mega breakout star that maybe the general audience doesn't know yet, right? Like we know Caleb, we know Ledecky, but who's next? Let me know in the comments section below. What do you all think? Okay, guys. And now, now we're moving on to topic number five. And topic number five comes to us today from David from San Diego. Ah, San Diego. Good morning, Cody. Like you, I'm a huge movie fan and my favorite genre is comedy. I was wondering, what are some of your favorite comedic movies? I love all the swimming content. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll take a moment to talk about movies with us. My fingers are crossed. Thank you for the best part of the day. <laughs> I love when people are writing that, the best part of the day. That's funny, that's just something that I just said once before I dove in for like a morning swim and a vlog and, it, and like people always, when they see me, they're like, best part of the day, it's just this thing, it's kind of funny, um, like kind of a joke, but you know, I, I love that. So yes, I'm a huge movie fan, huge movie fan. Um, and let's talk about this. So I read this question and I was like, okay, let me make like a top six, seven, eight list of comedies. And uh, first of all, at the end of this, I'll tell you two of my favorite comedies of all time. Like my, I will tell you my number one favorite comedy of all time and my number one romantic comedy of all time. I will tell you that. But before that, I'm gonna give you this short list. In no particular order, this is like my top six favorite comedies. Bridesmaids. Bridesmaids is a movie that made me cry, cry laugh, physical tears laughing. And it's, it's a movie that I was dragged to. I didn't have any interest in seeing this movie because I saw the trailer and I saw all these these women and I thought, this is a movie about a girl getting married. It just, I, I don't think I am the demographic for this movie. Like, I don't think this movie was made for me. This probably isn't my humor. And let me look up when this movie came out. Bridesmaids release date. Um, I'm trying to remember what year this came out. Okay, this was 2011. So yes, that, 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 that lines up. So I had a girlfriend at the time we don't talk anymore, but she dragged me to this movie and I did not want to see this movie. I was like, this is going to suck. This is, this is going to be dumb. And I could not have been happier five minutes into that movie. I mean, I cry there. The scene, the scene when they all get like kind of stomach bugs from the Mexican restaurant, the very sketchy Mexican restaurant that they ate at. And then they're all just pooping their pants and they're, they're in the middle of the street having just tried on wedding dresses. They're still wearing dresses and they're just Hooping. Like I was in tears and there's so many moments in that movie that made me cry laughing. So Bridesmaids is one of my all time favorite comedies. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you got to see it. The Grand Budapest Hotel. Corky, weird Wes Anderson movie. It's an acquired taste, but it's sometimes I think that's my favorite comedy of all time, but it's so different. Anyway, may, maybe check that out. Uh, Jackass, the series. Take, take your pick of any one of the Jackass movies. As dumb and as raunchy as they are, the Jackass show was one of my favorite TV shows in high school. I used to love watching it on MTV. And I remember going and seeing Jackass number two in theaters with my buddy Jake. His mom took us because we weren't 18. We couldn't get our tickets yet. <laughs> and uh, she was so pissed. Like she, when, when Steve-O is in the porta potty attached to those giant rubber bands and he's bouncing up and down and there's poop just all over him and he's getting hurled around the inside of this porta potty. I, I was laughing my butt off but my buddy Jake's mom was really pissed. And that was, that was a really fun experience. So any one of those movies is funny. Um, Wedding Crashers, a classic. I love Wedding Crashers. Anchorman, come on, Ron Burgundy, hello. And uh, The 40 Year Old Virgin. Those are, those are some of my all time favorite comedies, okay? That gives you a little insight into like, I like, I like some crude humor, I really do. Um, and now my favorite romantic comedy of all time is Forgetting Sarah Marshall. If you haven't seen it, it's about a guy who gets broken up with and then goes decides to go on vacation just to clear his head and get away from, you know, get out of town. And he goes to Hawaii and his girlfriend just happens to be there with her new lover played by Russell Brand. And Russell Brand is this like really ridiculous, outrageous rock star character. Um, love that movie. A hilarious romantic comedy. But my favorite comedy of all time, my favorite comedic movie of all time is the treasure, the perfect, probably couldn't get made today, Tropic Thunder. Tropic Thunder is a really divisive movie. You either love it or you don't. 
You either love that humor or you don't. And I love Tropic Thunder. So that is my that is my favorite comedy of all time. What are your favorite comedies? Let me know what you guys think down below. Am I missing something? Is there a glaring weakness in my list? What are some of your favorite comedic movies? Let me know down below. Thank you, David, for the question. Greatly appreciate it. And now we're moving on to our sixth and final topic of the day. And this topic comes to us from an anonymous viewer who writes, oh, from Birmingham, England. Oh, that's cool. Um, and Anonymous writes, Hello, Cody. I hope this isn't too personal for your show, but I'm going to take a shot at it. I'm considering asking my girlfriend to marry me, so I wanted to ask how you... I'm sorry, let me reread that. So I wanted to ask you how and when you knew Allie was the one. I've seen you talk about your relationship with Allie, and I greatly admire it. When you were certain, when were you certain you wanted to marry her and could you tell us why? I love when the sh when she pops up in the vlog. You guys are the best. I hope the babies are doing well. Thank you. Well, this is cool. Uh, the babies are doing well. Thank you, Anonymous, for writing that. And good luck. Good luck on your on your uh, engagement endeavor. Hopefully it all we're all we're all here rooting for you. Hopefully it works out. Yeah, so I'll tell you what, it was a slow burn with Allie for me, but there was a moment where, and it wasn't just one moment where I was like, oh my God, she's the one. That was like a, it was a slow realization over time. But I remember six months into our relationship, um, we had talked about maybe living together and then we moved in together like six months into living with each other. And I remember at that point in our relationship, I thought, okay, I felt like I should live with this person just to know whether or not, like, can we live together? Like, is that something, you know, like that, you know, and um, so I, I moved in with her and that was the first time in any relationship that I had ever had where I felt comfortable where I was like, yeah, I think this is the next step is moving in with her. And as I said, it was a slow burn, but before I met Allie, I never wanted children. I never wanted children, never even considered it, never even thought about it. And then after dating Allie for over a year, I started thinking about what it would be like to have kids. And then I started thinking about, okay, like what would I want in, what would I want in a wife in regards to raising children? And I had, a, there were a few moments where I was like, I can't believe I'm actually thinking about this. And then I started going down the list of like, you know, all the qualities that I would want in someone to help me raise kids. And she kind of fit that bill perfectly. Um, and so I kind of accredit that. Like, I am super happy now that we have two boys, love them to death. Like, they're the best things that ever happened to me. But before Allie, it wasn't even something like, like I had, I dated a number of people and I was never, I, I never even thought about kids. I never even, and it wasn't that I wasn't, didn't want serious relationships. It wasn't that I didn't want to move forward in my life with another person because that is something that I wanted. Um, but Allie to me unlocked things in me that I didn't know were there. And that was like a, that was a journey within itself. And so I'm no relationship expert. I am not a person to give any kind of relationship advice. All I can do is talk about my experiences. But I'll tell you this, I realized before I proposed to Allie or made the decision that I wanted to marry her that, that she made me better. Like Allie made me a better person. Like you are a slightly different variation of yourself to every to everyone around you, right? Like you interact with different people different ways and different people bring different things out of you. That's why, you know, to put it in a sw to swimming context, some coaches work really great with certain athletes because of the way that they communicate and understand each other. And some athletes work terrible with certain coaches because they just don't mesh well, they just don't jive. And with Allie, everything just, everything really fired on all cylinders and she bought, she brought the best thing out of me on a personal level and, and helped me grow and be more introspective and question like, okay, like what is my life beyond just swimming in a pool going to be like, what is my life post competitive swimming, all those types of things, like all those like existential questions that people eventually have. Um, and so, yeah. Um, there wasn't like a, an aha moment where I woke up and I'm like, I'm going to marry this girl. Like, in fact, and I, Allie gets mad when I tell people this, but on our very first date, on our very first date, we ate at the Taste of India restaurant in Bloomington. 
I had a moment where Ali was talking to me and I, I'm, this is a hundred percent true story. I had a moment where I was like, I don't know if I can do this because she was talking so much because Allie's a talker. Allie talks a lot and she is, she is what I call a verbal processor. So like a lot of times you have thoughts running through your mind about things you need to do, things you want to do, things that you're thinking about and those just go through your mind. Verbal processors do that, but they vocalize it. And she just, she, vo and so, so we're, we're super, super different. But on our very first date, she was talking so much that I was like, man, this girl talks a lot. But I, I mean, come to find out, she was just nervous and I was just nervous too. And um, despite what people think, despite the fact that I have this YouTube channel and I make a living making silly swimming videos and I do this video podcast, I'm much more of an extrovert or in, I'm, I am much more of an introvert than I am an extrovert. And Allie's definitely the other way, right? So like we kind of we kind of balance each other out a little bit. Um, you know, I turn when I when I'm not vlogging or turn the camera off. I'm pretty I'm a relatively chill, dude. I'm much more reserved. I don't talk as much. I mean, I get really excited and energetic about certain things, you know. But but most of the time, I'm a much more chill person. And Allie's not. She's like a hummingbird, just buzzing around, go go go. Um, and I love that. I love that we kind of you know kind of balance each other out. But anyway, that uh yeah. So. Uh, good anonymous viewer. Good luck with your relationship. Um, I hope that everything works out. Everyone here from the Cody Miller Show audience is rooting for you. And thank you for the question. And that is it, guys. That is it. Um, I hope this was, a, this was a fun episode. Hopefully you got something out of this. Um, as always, please, if you haven't done so already, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Share my videos with your swimmer friends with all this kind of stuff. Um, these episodes are going to drop Monday mornings. Um, my vlogs will continue on Wednesdays. We're just now getting back into the swing of things, right? The college teams have started training again. So I'm now starting to get back into like training shape, which is great. Um, I am still booking clinics for the remainder of the year. I've got a couple weekends. So if you'd like me to come out and do a personal swim clinic for your club team or your swim team, fire me an email. Um, you can send it to the Cody, to Cody Miller's Cody Miller show at gmail.com or my contact email on my Instagram. That's also fine. We do have merch on the merch store. Um, new lines are coming, um, but we I think we still have a few more of the errors overrated tea and a few of the only good days teas. Um, let's see, am I missing anything else? Um, if you'd like a personalized video for me, I am on Cameo, pump up videos, happy birthday videos, you name it, it's there. Um, the, the virtual Zoom coaching that I discussed in the last episode, I have to put it off a couple weeks just because we're working on the tech, the, the technological side of being able to deliver those things. But eventually what's gonna happen is people who want to can buy a package and then that, and, and then that package, you'll be able to submit race footage, training videos, whatever footage you have of yourself swimming and then I will go ahead and like critique it live and do voiceovers and um, give my tips and my insight into what you're doing right, maybe what you could do a little bit better, all that kind of stuff, virtual coaching. That stuff is coming soon, so keep your eyes you know, open for that. Just give it a, give it a few more weeks. Um, but yeah, thank you all. Um, I am gonna go get uh, a bite to eat because I'm kind of hungry. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Have a fantastic week. Have a good swim. Um, take care of one another, be kind to one another online, and thank you all so much. So until my next video, I will see you all later. Ooh.